Here's some vocabulary terms. As a chemist, we think about the system as that part of the chemical reaction we are studying, and everything around that chemical reaction becomes the surroundings. The system is the bonds that are being broken and the new bonds that are being formed through the course of a chemical reaction. If we see that the system loses energy to the surroundings, we had a word to define that. It was called exothermic. If the system gains energy from the surroundings, we had a word for that, and it was called endothermic. It's keeping track, really, of the energy flow from the surroundings and the system. Comparing the amount of energy in the system and the surroundings during a transfer just lets us figure out if the system is gaining or losing energy, and yet realizing that the net change remains constant. The word conservation means to stay the same. If this is the amount of energy before the energy transfer, so the system energy gauge is about half full. If the surrounding energy gauge then is about a quarter full, a little less. Through the process of a chemical change, notice here the system lost energy, but notice an equal amount of energy was gained by the surroundings. The net lost by the system equals the net gained by the surroundings. Energy is conserved. The units of energy, most commonly we use the metric unit known as the joule. Oftentimes though the joule is quite a small unit so we often talk about kJs or kilojoules of energy. It's defined as the amount of energy needed to move one kilogram mass a distance of one meter. One joule is the same as one newton meter which is equal to one kilogram meter squared per second squared. Here in America, we often talk about calories, calories of heat energy, especially in foods. It's the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. If you see a kilocalorie, commonly referred to as a, a capital C, that's also defined as a thousand grams of water, which is one kilogram. So a kilocalorie raises a thousand grams of water by one degree Celsius. The most common conversions that we will use, one calorie is 4.184 joules. One calorie with a C, notice that's a thousand calories with a small c, is a kilocal or 4,184 uh, joules. And a kilowatt hour, most commonly used from a power source when the uh, power company charges us for the use of electricity, comes in a kilowatt hour. 3.6 times 10 to the 6 units of joule energy. These conversions would be handy to have as you're tackling some homework where they're going to be asking you to convert from one unit to the other. So I'll keep my slide handy as well. This is a slide also that gives us an average energy use. If a joule is the amount of energy needed to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius, we can see some equivalent values with the different units. The energy required for a light bulb, a 100 watt light bulb, to run for an hour, and you see the different values for the different units. An energy used to run one mile, again that's approximate, and the energy used by an average citizen in America, you can see the energy coming to us in the different units. This is a nice to know slide. When we think about the law of conservation of energy, we really are looking at Newton's first law of thermodynamics, the law of conservation of energy. And the study of that very topic is called thermodynamics. How do we change energy from one form to another and keep track of it as we do so? And remember for a chemist, it's when bonds are breaking and new bonds are forming that we have a transfer of energy from the, sur uh, the system to the surroundings. The total energy in the universe is constant. So we can never design a system that will continuously produce energy without some source of input. Alrighty. So energy flow and conservation of energy simply is taking a look at, again, if this is a gauge of the amount of energy the system begins with and the amount of energy of surroundings begins with. Take a look if the gauge is showing that the system lost, the surroundings gained. And we just simply talked that that was an equal amount, the net constant. I'll get the hang of switching this. I think I'm turning them the opposite direction of what I need to. I apologize. 
So the term heat is the exchange of thermal energy from the systems to the surroundings. The system is the chemistry, the bonds that are involved in a, a chemical change, and the surroundings are us. And remember, that's where our thermometer is in our little calorimetry experiment. The thermometer is in the surroundings. Temperature is the measure of heat flow, and that's usually in a degree Celsius, although in the gas laws temperature, we also use the Kelvin scale. Heat flows from matter, from warmer to cooler object. Heat is a form of energy. Temperature is a scale, and again, usually degrees Celsius is that measurement for that scale. Heat is an energy typically measured in joules or kilojoules. The quantity of heat energy absorbed is defined as the heat capacity. When a system absorbs heat, its temperature increases. The increase in temperature is directly proportional to the amount of heat absorbed. The word heat capacity really is a proportionality constant. If I think about heat capacity, how much energy does it take to warm up an object? If I have a small amount of water or a whole lake full of water, how much energy is it going to take to raise this one degree versus an entire lake? The larger the heat capacity of the object being studied, the smaller the temperature rise for a given amount of heat. Water takes an incredible, incredible amount of heat energy to warm it up. Compare that to a metal, for instance. Copper or iron metal warms up very quickly with the temperature. The factors that affect heat capacity include, of course, what the object is made of and how much of the object you're measuring out. So the heat capacity depends on how much of the sample you have. 200 grams of water requires twice as much heat to raise its temperature as would 100 grams of water, that direct proportionality constant. It also depends on the type of material you're using. A thousand joules of heat energy will raise the temperature of sand by 12 degrees, but the same amount of water only gets warmed by 2.4. Water has a much higher heat capacity than sand. How much energy it takes to raise a whole object by one degree Celsius. However, if we think about the term specific heat capacity, we narrow it down to a per gram. Heat capacity is an intrinsic ability. It does not depend on how much you have because it makes the race fair. It says for every one gram, how much energy is needed to raise that object by one degree Celsius. The term specific heat puts it in a per gram basis. The previous slide, that heat capacity, how much energy for the entire object to raise by one degree Celsius. Specific heat we see gets the symbol C, or sometimes I see it CS, or CP for constant pressure or the constant system, uh, specific heat capacity. And the units for that is joules per gram degree Celsius. How much energy does it take to raise one gram of an object by one degree Celsius? If instead of the word gram, we put in the unit that the chemist often uses is a mole, we get the molar heat capacity. How much energy is ne needed to raise an object by one degrees Celsius if we had an entire mole's worth. Pause the video here and just take a moment to look through some specific heat values, asking yourself, what do these numbers mean? What information am I gaining by looking over specific heats?